Greetings, comrades. I think hardly anyone would argue that the Soviet Union did an impressive job of providing its citizens with housing. Mostly apartments in typical Soviet buildings – Stalinkas, Khrushchevkas and Brezhnevkas. From 1965 to 1985, more than 150 million people received free housing. At the same time, the sentence citizens of the Soviet Union were given free housing from the state is often met with objections. After all, there was no private property in the Soviet Union, and in the USSR no apartment belonged to the person completely. The state rented it out for life. Can we really call this giving free housing? Today we will try on the guise of an average Soviet citizen, puzzled by a simple question. How can I get an apartment? We all know the American dream, the cliché for the American ideal of life. A house, a high-paid job, a wife, success in the society, you know. Soviet society had its own analog, the famous consumer triad, that is, a separate apartment, a private dacha and a personal car. In Stalin's times, only the highest strat of the nomenclature could expect to have an apartment and dacha in a car, and they were given this set of assets by the state. Later on, these things became much more accessible to mere mortals, but Soviet people continued to be guided by this ideal until the collapse of the Soviet Union. At the same time, if we visualize this triad as a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then at the very top is most likely to be a car. A thing of status, but not absolutely necessary. Then comes a dacha, a pretty realistic and accessible goal, which is also very rewarding. And finally, at the very bottom, of course, a separate apartment. Let it be small and with low ceilings, but my own, even if it's state-owned. Let's look at different historical periods. How and to whom housing was distributed in the USSR? Who had to stay in barracks almost all their lives? And who could count on a luxurious separate apartment even in the most difficult 1930s? As always, we start with the Great October Revolution and the subsequent Great Transformation of millions of peasants into city dwellers. But it is actually worth mentioning the 19th century. With the development of industry in the 19th century, the influx of people from the countryside to the cities increased dramatically. The centuries-old way of life, when peasants outnumbered city dwellers and lived in their homes and villages, was being destroyed all over the world. Barracks and densely populated workers' settlements were established on the outskirts of cities everywhere. Revenue houses, which were the prototypes of modern apartment buildings, became very popular. A revenue house, or in Russian Empire, the Khodny Dom, is an apartment building built for renting out apartments. But even with the migration of people to the cities, by the time the Bolsheviks came to power, about 85% of the population still lived in the countryside. After the revolution, everyone became equal, and the housing problem in the cities at this stage was solved in the most revolutionary way. Housing was taken away from those who had more than one room per person and distributed to those who were poorer. Hey, it's free real estate. In total, up to 15 different families could move into an apartment of 200 or 300 square meters. Was that a good thing? Well, it was better than being homeless. Except that already in 1921, 37% of the houses in Moscow were considered unfit for living, largely due to the fact that the previous managers of the city economy had been dismissed by the government and the new ones had not yet been found. And the expropriation of bourgeois property could not continue indefinitely, while the industrialization which began in 1929 required even greater saturation of cities with workers. All this demanded the beginning of mass construction of housing. Especially since the Bolsheviks from the very advent to power declared their desire to improve the housing conditions of the working masses, to destroy the overcrowded and unsanitary old neighborhoods, to demolish unsuitable dwellings, 
to rebuild the old ones, to build new ones, appropriate for new living conditions of the working masses. It's funny that it was then, at the very beginning of industrialization, that the first Stalin cars began to appear, which even after almost 100 years are considered the pinnacle of Soviet construction. The problem is that Stalinkas were elite housing, available only to the upper classes of Soviet society. Yes, somehow they still were classes. The rest of the population was offered mass, cheap housing. At first, the industrialization program did not envisage the construction of normal housing for workers at all. The basic housing was hastily erected one or two-story wooden barracks built next to the enterprises. Housing near work sounds like a dream for a working man. Except that the quality of this housing was abominable. It was extremely easy to get a place in such barracks. Just get a job and there will be a room for you. One or two shared kitchens per floor, toilets in the yard, no hot water. You had to wash in public baths. Not only tough metallurgical or mining workers lived in such barracks, but also teachers, doctors and other representatives of the intelligentsia. This is how Rudolf Walters, who worked in the USSR in Novosibirsk as an architect in 1932-1933, described it. Only top officials and party members, as well as a few married foreign specialists, occupied separate two-room apartments. Russian engineers, if they were married, had one room with a very large family, two. Two or more such families shared one kitchen. No one would believe me if I said that single workers shared one room in barracks with 20 to 30 people. Many families had to share one room and so on. To be fair, Walters was not happy with his time in the USSR and later he worked for the Reich, so perhaps he was exaggerating. Besides, Novosibirsk, like many Siberian cities, was being rapidly built at that time, and the situation was better in the older cities of the European part of the country. But the point still stands. You could count on separate housing in a monumental new Stalinist building only if you were an absolutely unique specialist or a top-level party worker. After the war, the situation became even worse. For example, in the territories affected by the occupation, the loss of housing stock amounted to about 50%. At the same time, more attention began to be paid to the construction of housing. Standard house designs were created for all regions of the country. In general, houses of two to five floors were built. They were still mostly communal type houses, but gradually the state began to play with the idea that each family needed a full-fledged apartment. It started under the late Stalin, and already in the early 50s it became possible for me mortals to get a separate apartment. Yes, there were not many such families, but there were some. In order not to sound unfounded, I will tell you the story of my family's house. After the war, my great-grandfather from my mother's side went to work on the people's construction site. And in 1950, he received two rooms in a communal apartment in one of the houses which he himself built. He had a family of five people. Only his son, a war veteran who had been waiting for his turn for 20 years of work at the factory, managed to get a separate apartment. On the other side of the family, my grandfather, who returned from the war and continued his service. Every time he moved to a new town, he got a room, usually in pre-revolutionary merchant houses. Only in 1957, when he was already head of the city's garrison, did he get a separate two-bedroom apartment in a Stalin cafe family of four. However, until the end of the 50s, getting a separate apartment was not a common practice, but a unique case. Everything changed on November 4th, 1955 when the historic decree number 1871 of the CPSU Central Committee and the USSR Council of Ministers on elimination of excesses in design and construction was issued. Cost-effective and rigorously functional construction increased dramatically, providing housing for many Soviet citizens. Nowadays, Khrushchevkas are considered a symbol of bad Soviet housing, but in fact it was a huge step forward compared to the Stalin era. Now any family could really count on an apartment of their own. The main goal of the state was to provide each Soviet family with a separate apartment. 
By the mid-1980s, about 85% of Soviet families were provided with separate state-owned apartments. So imagine that you are Vasya Pupkin, an ordinary Soviet guy somewhere in the 70s who decided to move to the city and have to live somewhere. Your factory is willing to give you a dorm room. But what's the quickest way to get your own apartment? Option number one. You already live in a private house in the suburbs, in place of which a new neighborhood of Khrushchevkas or Brezhnevkas is going to be built. In this case, your house will be demolished and you will be given an apartment in a new house on the same site. Option number two. Cooperative construction. You know that somewhere a group of people organized a cooperative, which concluded a contract with a construction organization to build an apartment building. And then the members of this cooperative received apartments in it. But firstly, this option appeared only somewhere in the 70s, and secondly, it did not get a lot of attention. It was available only for relatively highly paid workers, most often employees of government agencies, trade, writers, artists, diplomats, etc. Vasya Pupkin is a simple laborer. Finally, the third and most realistic option. You simply work at your factory and enter the waiting list for an apartment. When your turn comes up, you are given housing according to your family's needs. Vasya didn't have time to get married and have children. One bedroom apartment. Has a child. Two bedrooms. Has several children of different sexes. Well, he can count on three bedrooms and cannot be given a two bedroom one by law. The minimum standard of living space was calculated per person and could vary from region to region. Vasya excelled and became a teacher, artist, architect or even got a doctoral degree, he could count on additional square meters. Sounds nice? Sounds nice. But not everywhere. Public housing in the USSR was divided into departmental and executive committee municipal housing. The former was received by employees of various departments and large enterprises from their housing stock. The latter by everyone else at their place of residence in the district or city executive committees. Departmental housing was often more comfortable and there was a shorter waiting list. The order of enrollment in the housing queue was almost the same. It was necessary to collect certificates on the composition of the family, existing housing, characteristics from the applicant's place of work, and submit all of these together with an application to the Housing Commission of the Executive Committee or your enterprise. The Commission reviewed the documents of the applicant for housing and made a decision to register them or to refuse. The average length of stay in the municipal queue for an apartment ranged from 10 to 15 years. There were, of course, ways to speed up the acquisition of housing. Everything depended on the particular city, region and enterprise where the person worked. First, housing was provided faster in new cities and industrial centers. If Vasya Pupkin lives and works in St. Petersburg or Moscow, he will have to wait in line for 15 years. Ready to leave your beloved Leningrad for the Taiga? In a year you'll have your own apartment, and maybe they'll give it to you right away. Or in some large cities, workers at one neighboring factory stood in line for 15 to 20 years, and at another for 2 to 3 years. It was important to know where you could get housing faster and not to miss the moment. There was temporary service housing for the military and some other categories, which after a certain period of living in it was assigned to a person as permanent. That's how street cleaners were lured to Moscow. Ten years of work and your official temporary service housing becomes permanent and you become a full-fledged Moscovite. It was worth putting up with a dozen years in an unprestigious job. Fictitious marriages were also widespread in order to obtain Moscow residence registration, and thus the opportunity to get in line for Moscow housing. There were also preferential queues, where housing was obtained faster, for veterans of World War II, large families, etc. It should not be forgotten that the very system of queues for housing could not but lead to scandals. It was always possible to move up the queue if you knew the right people. However, when the alternative was a room in a communalka or a barrack, you did not have much choice. So, to summarize, the right to receive free housing for every resident of the Union was enshrined in the Constitution. But that did not mean that he would get it instantly, 
The fact that in the USSR tens of millions of people received free new housing from the state through the housing queue is an indisputable fact. The fact that there were families who lived in barracks until the collapse of the country is also an indisputable fact. At the same time, when admirers of the Soviet Union claim that housing was given away for free, they somehow forget to mention that the apartments did not belong to the tenants. They could not be sold or inherited because they actually belonged to the state. The state leased them for life free of charge. Is that a bad thing? Well, in theory, yes. For example, you could be kicked out of your accommodation at any time. Or compacted. They could put some random people in your extra room, turning your comfortable Khrushchevka back into a communal apartment. Besides, we all know that free cheese is only in a mousetrap, so if you got the apartment for free, it means that its cost was incorporated some way in taxes, in your salary or in something else. That's all true, of course, but these arguments are pretty much just made up out of thin air. Could you have been evicted from the apartment given to you by the factory for systematic drinking and truancy? In theory, yes. In practice, there were maybe a dozen of such cases for every few million issued apartments. Compaction did exist, but was also pretty rare and had almost completely ceased by the early 1970s. Was the cost of an apartment built into taxes? I'm sorry, but we still pay taxes now, but for some reason nobody is in a hurry to give us free apartment for these taxes. Yes, with the help of housing distribution, the USSR tried to control migration flows in the interest of the state, sending masses of people to their construction sites of the century. So what? Is it bad to be able to get an apartment in a year by agreeing to develop new territories? Not at all. Yes, the apartments could not be sold, but there were loopholes. They could be exchanged with an additional payment which everyone took advantage of. You can't leave it as an inheritance. You just register your children and grandchildren in the apartment, and when you die, the apartment goes to them. What other advantages were there in this system? The housing and utilities payments in the USSR were low and amounted to about 5% of average per capita income. And this, of course, was a sharp contrast to the West, where in the 1980s up to 30% of income could be spent on rent. Moreover, the Soviet Union provided dwellings with centralized heating, hot water and other benefits of civilization. Not even talking about libraries, theaters, cinemas in every neighborhood. You can laugh as much as you want about infrastructure failures in Russia, but there is no other country in the world with such a developed system of centralized heat, water and electricity supply in such difficult natural conditions, and it is all the merit of the Soviet Union. One can also recall the map with a share of citizens owning their own housing in Europe. Such a good position of Russia, paradoxically, is also a legacy of the USSR, and the result of privatization so hated by everyone. Yes, privatization of enterprises turned out to be a way to plunder the country and enrich a narrow circle of individuals, but privatization of housing turned out to be a vital thing for the population of the country. It was thanks to it that millions of people did not end up on the streets after the collapse of the USSR. Thus, like most other aspects of life in the Soviet Union, the housing situation had both pros and cons. People lived in communal houses for decades, waited their turn, and then moved in as families in cramped Khrushchevkas with thin walls and bad insulation. Meanwhile, party workers and other privileged strata of the population could count on luxurious apartments in the best houses in the city centers. Yes, the cost of these apartments was probably built into salaries and taxes. But does it really matter if the result was obvious? The absolute majority of Soviet families were provided with separate housing, which they received without any payment, without loans, without mortgages, without constant fear that one day the bank would simply evict them for overdue payment. At the same time, the housing was relatively comfortable and provided with all the necessary services. But the average living space per person was less than in Europe and the USA. This is also a fact. Ordinary citizens of modern Russia can no longer, as it was in the case in the Soviet times, count on receiving a free state apartment. This happens only in extremely rare cases. If your current housing is literally falling apart, if you are a veteran of World War II, so around 100 years old, if you are an orphan, or if you are a famous French actor. 
Plus, there is service housing for the time of employment in the military, government agencies, security and judiciary services, for small number of medics and scientists, but only for the time of employment. If you resign, you lose your housing. There are no conditions like 10 years and the apartment is yours forever practically anywhere anymore. For the rest, either rent, buy or live in the Khrushchevkas that your grandmother left you. According to research in 2021, only 32.8% of families can afford to buy an apartment with a mortgage in Russia. In some regions this figure is 75%, in some regions it is only 10 And that means 30 years of constant payments to the bank with the fear of losing the apartment in case of unexpected difficulties in life. But you can choose the house and apartment yourself and not stand in line for 15 years. And yes, you can even change jobs and your housing queue will not be reset. What is better, decide for yourself. Thanks for watching. And as always, a huge shout out to my biggest supporters. Elizabeth Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berze, Jimmy Albin, Eli, Petr Ilich and Bruce Etzernik. See you guys next time.